Good evening, everyone, and you're all very welcome to tonight's webinar, which has been brought to you tonight by the Chagas Mayo Advisory Staff here tonight. Now, my name is Brendan Gary, and I work in Chagas and Ballinrobe, and tonight, for the next hour, I'm delighted to be your host for this webinar. Now, normally this time of year, we would host a number of events throughout the region, but tonight, due to COVID-19, we're coming to you in the form of a webinar. And indeed, this is the final episode in this series, which has been run for the last number of weeks. And if you are new to this uh, series of webinars, all previous episodes can be watched back in full on our Chagas Mayo YouTube channel, and would encourage you there to subscribe to our channel. Now tonight the focus switches to parasite control and some timely animal health issues. And we're all well aware that by achieving high uh, health status on our farms, we will contribute towards farms operating more efficiently. And tonight we will look at some of these issues. And our first speaker tonight will be Amy Connolly from Chagas and Ballina, and Amy will give us an update there on parasite control in sheep and cattle systems. By later tonight, our guest speaker will be well-known beef specialist Aidan Murray from Chagas and Donegal, and Aidan will give us some advice in relation to health and management issues surrounding suckler cows, and might give us some pointers there also in relation to preparing for calving. Now, you, the viewers at home tonight, are being encouraged to engage with our panelists here tonight, and you can put your questions in there to the Q&A function at the bottom of your screens, and would encourage you there to engage there with Amy and Aidan tonight. And later this evening, Vivian Silt, the Chagas Regional Manager here in County Mayo, will pick up your questions and will put your questions live to our panelists here tonight. And any unanswered an questions will be followed up in the coming days, but hopefully we'll get to all the questions tonight. So this webinar has been recorded and will be available to watch back hopefully tomorrow on the Chagas Mayo YouTube channel in case you missed it. And indeed, um, without further delay, I am now going to hand it over to you, Amy, uh, to start sharing your presentation with us. And indeed, keep your questions. They're coming in tonight and we will pick them up at a later stage. So over to you now, Amy. Thanks very much, Brendan. Um, so this evening, I'm going to speak to you about parasite control in cattle and sheep. Brendan, I just want to make sure that you can see my presentation before I kick off. Yeah, that's perfect. perfect. Thank um, you. I'm based in Chagas and Ballina. So this evening, we're going to look at worms, liver fluke and ectoparasites. There are three topical things at the minute that you're either going to be dosing for or using porons or injectables to treat. So worms, worm infestations can result in scouring, lack of thrive and economic loss. Fecal egg counts and a drench test are essential components of any successful worm management plan. Just the life cycle of a worm, adult female worms produce eggs in the sheep that are passed out in the dung. Once they're outside the animal, they develop into larvae or the larval stages develop from stage L1 to L3. The L3 larvae may survive and overwinter on pasture. Sheep become infected when they ingest the L3 larvae and once these larvae are ingested, they become adult worms within sheep or cattle within three weeks. So what do I need to dose for with, for worms this winter? With yews and cows, you shouldn't need to dose them unless there is a demonstrated need. So unless you have a faecal egg count to prove, you know, that they need dosing or if you've any maybe under-conditioned cows or yews. If you have replacement jaw lambs or heifers or maybe your own store lambs or cattle, an anti-helminthic that works in your farm after a faecal egg count shown the need to dose. And then bought in store lambs or bought in cattle, an appropriate quarantine dose. Just briefly, the drench test procedure. So the first thing is to contact your vet or an approved lab to get two sample kits. Now, this example here, I suppose I have it written out for lambs, but it's effectively the same for cattle. Select a group of 15 lambs at random and hold them in a pen. Place a mark on them or record their tags to be able to identify these lambs for testing at the second step. Allow up to one to two hours for the lambs to defecate in the pen and collect 10 fresh dung samples and place them in containers. Dose your lambs then with the chosen product and rate. Post the samples as soon as possible with the relevant details included, preferably on the day of sampling. And what I'd say is, you know, I suppose try not to take the dung samples on maybe a Thursday or a Friday because you don't want them sitting in the post all weekend. You do want them getting to the lab as quickly as possible. A post dosing sample then is needed to check the efficacy of the dose so that steps two and four will need to be repeated. If you've dosed with a group two product, so it's a yellow wormer, which is your levamazoles, you need to retest seven days later. 
Whereas if you've dosed with a benzimidazole or a macrocylic lactone, you retest 14 days later. The anti-helminthic classes. So there's three classes of anti-helminthics that are widely available to you all, be it in your local co-op, in your vets, and they're the white, yellow, and clear drenches. Um, the two, the orange and the purple drenches are available from your vets only, and they are quite expensive when compared to the other three wormers. And you need a prescription for the other two uh, for the orange and the purple doses. These good practices, I suppose, these are based for, um, you know, anti helminthic resistance in sheep farms, but likewise, you know, there is important for cattle farms. So the first is don't dose mature yews for worms unless there is a demonstrated need. Undosed yews like cows help to maintain a susceptible worm population within a farm. Fecal egg count from June to September to determine, determine the need for dosing and fecal egg count again after dosing to determine its effectiveness. Use only a white drench to treat for nematodirus and lambs as there's no resistance as of yet detected to nematodirus for the white drenches. And then quarantine drench all bought in sheep to avoid buying in resistant worms. So it's either your orange and a yellow or a clear drench or the purple and the yellow drench. House sheep for 48 hours after you've given them their quarantine drench and then introduce these sheep to ground, which has been recently grazed by your own sheep. Moving on then to liver fluke. So liver fluke is a flat worm. It's very pathogenic, which means it's disease causing. It infects cattle and sheep of all ages and they do not build up immunity. It's farm year and field specific. So what I mean by this is, you know, it's impacted by the climate this, in the given year, the land type, the soil type, and, you know, I suppose the weather that year as well. The image here just gives you an example of what liver fluke look like. Economic losses due to liver fluke. So you've reduced performance or thrive, which, you know, is from reduced feed conversion efficiency. Work which was done by Animal Health Ireland has shown that fluke could be costing 70 euro per finished bullock um, in lost performance due to, I suppose, been not or not been treated correctly for a liver fluke. Lower body condition score, which in sheep can result in lower litter size and longer lambing spread, loss of liver value and mortality. The life cycle of liver fluke, so it is, I suppose, quite complex. Um, in order for it to complete its life cycle outside the host, it's dependent on weather. So it needs moisture and a temperature over 10 degrees. The life cycle of liver fluke begins in the bile duct of cattle or sheep, with the adult fluke mating and laying eggs. These make their way to the intestine of the cattle or sheep and pass out onto pastures. It's estimated that adult fluke can pass out between 5,000 and 20,000 eggs per day. When these fluke are in the environment and when environmental factors allow, they hatch into what is called infective larvae or mercidia. These mercidia then have as little as three hours to seek out their intermediate host, which is the mud snail seen here. The mud snail is needed for their next stage of development. A mercidium penetrates into the, the digestive tract of the mud snail and develops into a cercaria. Um, and it multiplies quite largely in the mud snail. After six to eight weeks, the cercaria emerge from the mud snail onto pasture and they move to attach themselves onto the grass leaves, forming a tough cyst, and they become metacercariae. Once it's mild and humid at this stage, it helps these cysts to survive or the liver fluke to survive on herbage for up to six months. Then once they're ingested by the sheep or cattle, they're in their immature fluke stage, they burrow through the gut wall into the liver and the life cycle of them starts again. Generally, this life cycle is completed from May to October in Ireland. Diagnosis of liver fluke. So if you have any sudden deaths on the farm, be it cattle or sheep, you know, get their livers looked at to see if there is any live liver fluke there or if there is any previous damage from liver fluke. Slaughter reports. So there's a significant number of meat plants which have signed up to the Animal Health Ireland Beef Health Check programme. 
And this is a process where a vet on the kill line in the factory looks at the liver and the lungs on your animal as they're on the factory line and categorizes them. You can check with your lo local slaughter plant to see if they are participating. The categories, I suppose, for the livers are normal, liver damaged by fluke, but no fluke detected, liver damaged by fluke and live fluke detected, liver with other damage and a liver abscess. So it gives you, you know, I suppose, instant information that if there were a live fluke in those animals, you know you need to treat the remaining animals that were in that batch. With faecal egg sampling, fluke eggs are only present if the animal has been exposed to fluke larvae on pasture for at least 12 weeks before examination. Fluke are intermittent shedders, so there could well be fluke eggs in the dung today and not tomorrow. Um, any farmers who are on the webinar tonight who are part of the BPS programme would have had to do faecal egg counts for it for detecting liver fluke and rumen fluke. And then your farm history and season. There's, here is the 2021 liver fluke forecast, and it's based off of weather data from Met Aaron from May to October 2021. The Department of Agriculture have also collected blood samples from lambs in meat factories to test for the presence of liver fluke antibodies in their blood, and to also determine the timing and geographical spread of liver fluke across grazing lambs in Ireland. The number of flocks selected for testing or sampling in each county is proportionate to the sheep numbers in that county. So if you look here where my green line or green circle is, it's green, which indicates that there's little or no liver fluke disease or prevalence in that area, which is in the east of the country. Then if we look, I suppose, diagonally across Ireland in the orange or yellow, there is occasional losses or occasional prevalence of liver fluke there. And then if we look here in the west of Ireland where we are, you know, it's high disease prevalence or, you know, it's a very high risk area for liver fluke. So you can use this while, when you're deciding when to dose or what to dose with for a liver fluke on your farm. So this here now is the active ingredients which you can use to treat liver fluke. Examples of certain brands, the weak weeks that animals would need to be housed before dosing, the stage of liver fluke controlled and the withdrawal. With winter treatment for liver fluke, the aim is to kill adult and immature fluke and to prevent liver damage as well as ill thrift. With spring and summer treatment, so you can be thinking for next spring when you're going to be letting cattle out of sheds, it's to remove the adult fluke burden accumulated from previous infections and reduce summer infection of the mud snails so that your animals aren't actually shedding fluke eggs when, when they're gone back out to pasture. Triclobendazole controls fluke from two weeks after it's ingested by the animal. And if you use triclobendazole three weeks after housing, you will kill all stages of fluke. And that's bearing in mind once you don't have resistance to triclobendazole on your farm. Clozantil, rifloxanide, and nitroxanil kill any fluke over seven to eight weeks of age, depending on the product. Early immature will survive and they will mature then after that. So for example, if you use, say, or clozamectin an or on animals that were housed two weeks, you then have to retreat those animals five weeks later when the early immature fluke reached seven weeks so that you get them killed then with the next treatment. And that can be quite expensive. Um, as of the moment, as far as I'm aware, there's no nitroxinol based products on the market because Trodax is gone. Um, so I suppose hopefully, uh, you know, another brand or product does come in there to fill that gap. Then when we look at albendazole, clozorin and oxyclozonite, they only kill mature fluke which will have left the liver and moved to the bile duct of the animal. These fluke were eaten by the animal on grass 10 to 12 weeks before this. And with all of these products, just bear in mind that there could be possible product resistance on your farm. The risk when purchasing in any animals, so it's the same with whether you're purchasing in cattle or sheep, they should receive a quarantine dose for worms and for fluke. So, an example here is a clozontal or nitroxinol-based product and graze the driest area of your farm for a minimum of four weeks. 
repeat the treatment six weeks later with clozantel or seven weeks later with nitroxanil. And always bear it in mind, resistance, be it resistant worms or resistant flu, can be bought in onto your farm. This here just summarizes the parasites, their significance and the treatment for them. So with stomach, wor stomach worms and other gut worms, as well as inhabited larvae, it can you know, cause suboptimal performance and ostrategious type 2 disease. It's treated with benzmedazoles or endocticides. Levamazole only treats adult worms and it's not effective against inhabited larvae in, of stomach worms. With lung worm, you know, it's who, I suppose, commonly known as who's increased pneumonia risk in cattle. You can treat it with benzmedazoles, endocticides, and levamazole. And then liver fluke, it impacts by having poor growth, lower milk yield, poor fertility. And the treatment is dependent on the stage of liver fluke which you want to treat. Ectoparasites. So at this stage of the year, the ectoparasites that most of you will be targeting are biting and sucking lice, ticks, mites, and then in your sheep, sheep scab. The significance of these is they cause stress to the animal, which results in poorer growth and lower milk yield. The treatment of ectoparasites. So like here you can see on the left-hand side of the table, there's eight active ingredients to treat ectoparasites. Some of the active ingredients are similar, but you can see here with the parasites that they target, you know, I suppose they don't all cover all the parasites which I had listed on the slide previous. So it's important to bear in mind when you're picking, be it the pour on you're going to use or the injection, um, or even the dip you're going to use for your sheep, you know, what, make sure that it's treating the parasites that you want treated. And just on the right hand side then is an example of the products which contain those active ingredients. There is a publication available which has the products licensed for the control of parasites in sheep and it's available on the Chagas website at chagas.ie for such publications or from your local Chagas office. I suppose it's not just relevant for sheep, you know, it's very, I suppose it'd be very handy or very useful for any cattle farmers as well, because it is every product down there for worms, fluke and ectoparasites. And I suppose it's a real handy either pocket guide or you can have it on your phone. Just to summarise, avoid buying in resistant worms and fluke, follow quarantine dose advice. Use the correct active ingredient class for the stage or type of liver fluke or worms that you're targeting. Check its effectiveness using a fecal egg count or slaughter reports. Dose at the correct rate for the heaviest in the group. Check the accuracy of dosing equipment. So if you want to give an animal 10 mils, make sure that your dosing equipment is delivering that dose. Reduce some parasite burdens on your farm will increase productivity and result in increased profitability. Thanks for listening. Thank you very much there, Amy, you know, and indeed, look, you give us some great thought there and information there uh, in relation to the parasites. So now at this stage, I'm going to uh, ask you just to turn off your camera there, uh, Amy, and I'm going to now ask our guest speaker this evening, uh, Aidan Murray, uh, who is going to give us an update there in relation to some health and management issues in relation to suckler cows. And indeed, look, at, I encourage you there to keep putting your questions into the Q&A function, and we have some questions there already, so we'll come to those uh, after Aidan's presentation. So it's over to you now, Aidan. Okay, um, thanks very much, uh, Brenton. Um, i just get this on the slideshow and, and we'll take a run through it. Um, good evening, everyone. Um, thanks for inviting me to, to come and, 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 and speak on the webinar. Uh, I used to do a lot of discussion groups in Mayo um, uh, in, a few years ago, so, uh, and I always enjoyed going down there. Um, Look, the, this evening I, I'm just looking to cover a couple of uh, a couple of uh, areas, uh, and basically the outline is that we we'll look at suckler cow and the importance of condition score, and the reason I've decided to talk about that was that I've had a few queries this week from advisors in different places where fellows have rung up saying that they thought their cows were a bit thin, or in uh, one case there yesterday where um, a fellow rang up and said the cows calving in early March, but they're in way too good a condition. What can they do? Uh, and it, he's got a good quality silage. So just a couple of issues around that uh, and, and how those cows can be fed. 
and then the prep uh, preparation for Kevin and a few of the issues around animal health. So I'll take a quick run through that and and leave. We'll try and leave plenty of time at the end uh, uh, for for a few questions uh, and that. So look, my background is really working with discussion groups and and predominant interest has probably always been in suckler cows. So um, and and one of the thing the philosophies behind suckling was that sucklers were always traditionally put on sort of poor land type and you know the idea of it was that basically they went into a cycle uh, from the point of view that you calved them down you tried to get them to grass which was a cheaper feed uh, you tried to build up condition they reared their calf you took them in in the winter time hopefully with a, a good la layer of fat on them uh, and good condition you then let them sort of free wheel through the winter on lesser quality uh, winter feed so they used to lose weight uh, and calve down safely and then the cycle started again where you turned them out so there was no real net gain uh, on mature cows in terms of their weight uh, once the cow was four or five years old she had reached her mature weight and so basically you had the same weight being produced starting the end of the year and, and we would have seen that for uh, Michael Drennan's work in Grange for a number of years but this notion of condition scoring was to look at basically well, what is the, the reserves or what is the body cover on these cows and it's standalone to live with because you could get two animals that step on the scales one is at 600 kilos uh, both at 600 kilos yet one could be a well fleshed uh well covered 600 kilos and another one could be very framey carrying little very little flesh and that has implications particularly in the run up to cavan in terms of how those uh, how those cows might perform so it's a technique that you know it's done through handling you would have seen it maybe on on demonstrations there's a few good videos online in relation to how it would work but basically what it's telling you is look get your cows take a close look at them, go through it. We had a group of advisors in Grains there a couple of weeks ago, and we just pulled out a, three three or four cows out of the, the batch of one of the herds in Grange. And you can see the range within any herd of cows. If you go out to your own yard and look at your cows, you'll have young cows that are maybe light. You'll have older cows that are maybe a bit thinner. You'll have cows that are maybe have had their fourth or fifth calf that are maybe mud fat at this stage, and they're all essentially been given the same type of silage and, and the same uh, the same feeding and that you know is probably there's some cost saving to be made there if we can thin down some of the heavier ones and there's a cost added if we have to try and put condition on some of the thinner ones but the idea is to try to get them into the right condition uh, at Cavan because having them in the right condition at Cavan you know could or, or would actually potentially make Cavan much more straightforward but it's a knock-on effect in terms of their reproductive formants how much milk they'll be able to give how healthy the calf will be how quickly you're going to get them into calf and you know obviously the main one of the main aims is that they're not in too good a condition to send you down the road to difficult calving um, this is one of our technicians michael fagan who does a lot of work on the newford herd but has uh, been based and had been based in grange and he's just handling some of the animals uh, there in the crush, which was a routine thing in the Better Farm program, uh, and it'll be a routine thing that in, in the, the future beef program that, that Chagas have uh, just launched there a few weeks ago. So you're basically handling them along the, the line, looking to see the, the, the bones or the transverse processes that come out, feeling them to see are they, do they, are, are they sharp? Are they well-rounded uh, or what the condition is there uh, in terms of the level of flesh that's been carried again around the tail head is it sort of spongy uh, um, or is it is the skin tight and, and you can feel the hardness or again if you rub the palm of your hand along the ribs are the ribs easily felt or not and we basically just score them uh, on a point from one to five one being practically emaciated uh, to five being uh, obese uh, in terms of over uh, way over fat and you know generally at this time of year a lot of cows will be running sort of from two to three and a half depending on what stage they're at uh, in terms of uh, spring calvers that have come in uh, it could be to do with their age uh, it could be to do if you know they had a setback or they were lame before they come in and lost condition so all of that's important but it's just to you know you know and it can be very awkward you know you really need to be taking them out running them up the crush uh, when you're dosing them or, or treating them for lice or whatever it is 
and basically saying, look, that gives you the best picture of where these animals are at. You know, we feed them every day. We walk along the feed rail, we look in, and unless you're in through them or you have them up through the crush, you know, you can miss individual cows that are getting a bit thin or, or cows that are getting a wee bit too heavy that we need to take a wee bit of action on. And so it's important from that point of view uh, that, we're, that we're looking at them regularly. Um, and this is the point that I was making to you earlier on in terms of, you know, the, the, the sort of condition. We're looking to have them in various conditions uh, um, depending on what stage of the productive cycle they're at. So now as we approach calving time, um, we would be hoping that cows that came in maybe in the condition score of three, which were well covered, may have lost a bit of condition since they've come in. If they're calving in February, March, you know, if they're in around that sort of two and a half, 2.75 at calving time, uh, that's uh, a good fat condition for calving. They're not over fat. You're not expecting too much of a fat build up and, and around the pelvis, which the calf is to come through. Um, uh, and and uh, they should be well fat to calf. Generally speaking, once the calf down um, and, and get rid of the calf, get rid of the, the cleanings uh, and are maybe held on site for a few weeks before they're turned out, generally a lot of cows will lose a bit more condition. They're in milk. Um, they're maybe on lesser quality silage compared to the grass. So they may drop back slightly in condition. And it's important at this stage that you don't let them drop back too much. And then you see there where we start the green line, where basically they recover all their weight again uh, once they hit grass. And by the time you get to early June, a lot of cows, for example, cows that would be turned out in Grange uh, traditionally and sort of late March and into early May will have regained that weight by 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 uh, early june if you're maybe some parts of the west uh, including my own county where cows don't see grass until may that obviously is going to be delayed but the the feeding value of the grass relative to what they've been getting inside starts that cycle and, and builds up all that weight that has been lost uh, while they have been in uh, and you can see that typically what happens a cow uh, that's comes in in the winter time she may be around 600 kilos by the time she loses or she's calved down, has lost the, lost the, the weight of uh, the, the birth weight of the calf, the cleanings, the birth fluids, uh, and, and maybe fed inside for a while, she could have lost 80 or 90 kilos. And that weight has to be made up then when, when the animal goes to grass. And generally speaking, as I mentioned earlier, that, that's what, what actually does happen, that they regain their full weight. Uh, and it's important, you know, from a rebreeding point of view, that they're on that upward green line again once once they get out uh, to get better conception uh, and better heats uh, and that and and try and keep the the the, the calving pattern uh, relatively tight. I have another graph later on, and it's it's very specific as to you know particularly first calvers why you know uh, how they need to be separated out and uh, given a wee bit extra uh, TLC as such after the calf, particularly if they're going to be housed for a while. So the, the advantage, I suppose, look, of the condition score from a cost saving point of view is if you have somebody that makes uh, good quality silage and you have, uh, that's able to maintain the cows, um, you know, cows that are over uh, in good condition, over a, condi a condition score of three, for example, you know, uh, we can uh, restrict those cows, bring them, uh, bring them back slightly in condition compared to an animal that has to be fed ad lib for the same period over the winter just to get them in fit condition to, to, uh, uh, to calve down. And that cow that's over three versus the cow that's two or less, you know, you're talking about potentially a ton and a half of silage. And one of the things that's going to happen as we go forward, and you would have heard it through the years with the staff and Mayo, is that silage quality will probably be given even more renewed focus as we go into this, try and combat climate change and that, because to have better quality silage winter feed uh, it will lead to better efficiencies. And, you know, the one thing about good quality silage is for suckler cows or weanlings or whatever, uh, or finishing cattle, good quality silage gives you flexibility. You can restrict it, you can feed a bit less of it, you can put on extra weight, depending on what you have to do. If you make poor quality silage, your hands are tied from day one, because the only way around it is if you're looking to put on the target weight on weanlands, looking to gain a bit of extra condition on cows, you have to go for concentrate, and that costs money. 
and it certainly costs money in a year like this year where ration prices are up probably damn near 100 euro a ton compared to compared to this time last year so you know just bear in mind uh, very good quality silage for cows coming in in good condition they can be restricted cows coming in thin good quality silage will build them up to where they need to be before the calf but poor quality silage you're limited without the use of concentrates as to what you're going to be able to do and and there'll be a, that message will come back loud and clear and stronger as we in the years ahead as we move on uh, with regard to the targets some of the targets around climate change uh, I suppose this is a concept and we talk about it ideally when you when the cows come in have you the facilities to group them uh, because of that range of condition the range of ages within the cows uh, and what what you'll see is that probably older cows first calvers maybe a cow that had twins or something those cows will be the cows that will probably show the least amount of condition coming in maybe at housing compared to the more mature cow that's had her second, third, fourth, maybe fifth calf that will come in in good condition. And, you know, the, the limitation at farm level is often we can't segregate them out. Oh, I would be work with some farmers there over the years that would have uh, their batch of six or seven in calf heifers and they'll just put them in a pen on their own and feed them and manage them because of bullying. Uh, uh, and 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 uh, not letting them mix with mature cows because generally speaking they won't hold their own and if you're trying to uh, control the feeding if heifers are not control or, or, or young cows are not able to hold their own with the mature cows they'll just go back in condition and if you're a long time off of grass uh, before you, you potentially go out after calving and that that can be an issue so you know when you look at your cows when you look at your housing facilities is there a pen that you can pull out maybe some of the younger cows, some of your thinner cows and feed them appropriately and maybe give them silage ad lib, whereas the other cows, you know, can they uh, can they be restricted a wee bit in silage? And I know one of the things that bugs me most is when you go out to the yard and cattle are maybe roaring at you. Uh, but I mean, you know, they get cattle get into a routine. If you have cows that are in over good condition and you have good quality silage, you know, Feed them a bit of silage at night time. And if it's bare in front of them when you go out in the morning or bare in the evening time when you come home from work, well, you know, that's fine. They'll get used to that after a day or two. But that's me what have to what you may have to do in order to peel them back in condition. So don't be afraid to do that if you have reasonable quality silage and you can segregate them out. Restricting silage and not being able to segregate animals out will punish the thinner animals and the younger animals even more. And, and you'll see such a big drop off, what I call it, in, in, in condition. And I think we need to be we need to be fairly careful of that. Um, dry cow feeding. Look, uh, one of one of the one of the uh, uh, problems or one of the issues that came up there earlier in the week that I was saying to you uh, earlier on the uh, on the webinar was that somebody rang up saying that they had some very heavy cows and they were coming up to be calving in early March. What could they do? Uh, and one of the things that you must look at is if you have to take condition off animals or you have to put condition on animals, the ideal time to do it is probably at least 50 or 60 days out from calving. Once you get into that last sort of six weeks, you know, you want to be trying to avoid anything too severe with regard to how you manage feeding them. So, you, you know, the idea is 50, 60 days out that you have them in the condition that you want uh, and just maintain that condition up to calving. Uh, going too severe on them and trying to restrict them uh, or put them on straw or, or whatever to, to peel them back because you think, God, these cows are in too good a condition uh, and I'm going to end up with uh, a lot of calving problems or whatever. Uh, you know, starving the cows in the two weeks or in the six weeks up before calving will do very, very little in terms of the calf birth weight uh, because the calf will put on 90% of its weight in those last sort of 60 days. And the, there's like a little switch inside in the cow that basically said, look, this calf is take, going to take priority in terms of where the nutrients have to go. And it'll be diverted towards the growing calf inside. And so you, your cows may go back in condition, but you might find, and, and there's research to show it, that your calf birth weight might change actually very, very little. 
So, you know, we're trying to, if you've cowed Kevin in early March, you have, you know, mid-December through to mid-January to do a wee bit in terms of bringing the cow, con uh, cow condition back. Equally, thin cows, you can, uh, you know, ideally you want to be feeding them up. You don't want to be having thin cows a month out from Kevin saying, I'm going to have to supplement these cows because effectively you might very, do very little for cow condition uh, and that. Uh, uh, and, and maybe only add to your problems. So the idea is a month or two out, try and have the cows in as fit a condition. That's why it's important to sort of go through the cows and look at what stage they're at at the moment. <clears throat> in terms of what I call it, those cows that you think are in good body condition at the moment, if you've got sort of 64, 67 DMD silage, you know, uh, you can feed them that, that'll maintain their condition. Uh, plus six weeks out, try and get in with a, a decent dry cow mineral uh, and that, uh, uh, you know, a standard, whether it's 100, 120 grams a day that you give them. Some people might work with boluses, others will I'll sprinkle it on top of the silage, that's fine. Fat cows, which was the case that that uh, that we got in earlier in the week, the fellow reckoned the silage was in around 70, 72 DMD. Like, that fellow, if he wants uh, two months or three months out from Cavan, he would have to look at maybe giving those cows the equivalent of uh, 27, 30 kilos of fresh silage every day uh, in order to peel the condition back off them. Um, and that once you get into this routine where you have to restrict cows, cows' natural instinct is when they see you come to the yard or they hear the tractor or the bales going out or the the, the shear grab dropping in front of them is they all want to come to the rail. So if you're in, and because the, what, what they're getting is going to be limited. So you need to ensure that there's enough feed space for every cow uh, in that pen if you're going to restrict the feeding. Uh, because it's their natural instinct when they see feed pushed in or new bales coming out is to get up and come to the feed rail. That's why fellas, you know, that have autumn calves and cows and say, oh sure, I can never find them running inside. Because if they see you in the morning and the evening, they associate you with feeding them and their first intake is break the routine that they're at and come forward for feeding. Uh, uh, and so, you know, but have enough, don't try and restrict cows unless you have enough feed space because some cows will be severely punished in a situation like that. They'll just be bullied back and, and maybe cows that need, uh, uh, you, you, you just you just want to make sure that there's a, that, that that, that you don't go too severe on individual animals. And this idea of thinning them down before the calving them, you can't starve calving difficulty out of the cows because you won't affect calf birth weight. Uh, and as I say, there's been work done in Grange over the years that, that actually shows that. Uh, the thin cows pre-calving, uh, you know, um, basically if you've got that sort of 72 DMD silage, you could just keep it in front of them keep it fresh and let them eat what they want and they'll build up their condition. Moderate quality, 65, 67 DMD silage, that may need a bit of supplementation. But when you go in with a bit of concentrate, you need to be looking at the cows every few weeks. And I'm, you know, I'd prefer to have, if you have reasonably good silage, to try and keep them on the forage only because we can't really afford to be pumping a lot of concentrates into, into suckler cows. Uh, and that, okay, the exception if you've, a few very thin cows or a few cows carrying twins that have got very thin, well then, you know, you may have to step on and, and start to feed them. But again, it's like the other point that I made, the point that I made earlier, you're trying to correct this condition um, sort of six to eight weeks out before calving. And typically the cow below there at, at sort of a condition score of two or less, you can see there around the tail head, she's very bony uh, and that, uh, and if you were to feel along the line, the, the, the transverse process bones that are sticking out along the side, they would actually be quite sharp and quite pointed. And you'd be worried about uh, a cow like that having calving difficulty because of, you know, her condition, would she have the, 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 the energy to, to, to get a calf out? Uh, and that's so it's important from that point of view as well. About five minutes now, Aidan, okay? Oh, okay. Um, after calving nutrition, again, it, it depends on uh, the quality of the silage. That depends when you're actually going to turn out. If you have mature cows, for example, and they're on good quality silage, you can put them on that for, you know, three weeks, four weeks after the calf uh, and then turn them out. But if you have a cow calving and moderate quality silage and she's going to be in until May, well, then you're going to need to go in with 
probably about two kilos of concentrate uh, in order to keep condition on her, not allow much weight loss and, and give a milk supply to the cow. And, you know, we done an experiment a number of years ago in Grange where we looked at feeding cows to produce a certain level of milk. And uh, we, we fed them to produce six kilos, eight kilos uh, or nine kilos. And what we found was that, you know, what we, we the cows that were fed to produce six kilos actually produced six kilos and put on a bit of body condition. The cows that were fed to produce eight kilos, they produced slightly less than eight kilos and, and sort of held their own. And, and uh, the cows that we fed to produce uh, 12 kilos of, of milk only produced eight and they really piled on the condition. So some of the cows out there, their ability to produce extra milk, it, it, genetically, it may not be in them. Uh, and that, but at the same time, if you have cows that are calving in January and it's a while before they get to grass, well, then you're going to need to look after them. Otherwise, they'll be slower to come around. First calvers, the policy, for example, in Grange for heifers that will be calving the second half of February and into, into March would be that they always, after a week or so, get about a kilo and a half to two kilos of concentrate until they're actually turned out. Uh, and that's quite important because they are younger, they're still growing. You're trying to keep a bit of condition on them and not let them lose too much. Uh, again, you're giving them adequate sort of minerals uh, and that. And those, as I said, the point of the January and February calving cows, if it's a while before they grow to grass, you know, good quality silage plus a bit of concentrate is probably going to be needed to try and keep them up in condition and without allowing them to slip too much. And this graph really shows the importance and it was work that was done by Michael Drennan and Grange. The yellow line in the bottom is your first calver. And you can see, first and all, when they come in on the left-hand side, uh, they're, they're in lesser condition than, than the more mature cows. And they hold that right the way through the winter because they're still growing. And so they're in lesser condition when they actually calve down, which is the low point in the graph. But, uh, or sorry, the, the the red, um, the red line, uh, as heifers they're they're um, when uh, coming in as heifers they're in good condition. The calf down, lost a lot of condition, and then follow the red line out and across, uh, and you can see that even as we go into uh, the summer months, they still cannot build up the same level of condition. What happened in Grange was when we looked at the mature cows, when we got to that first week of June, they had almost 100% of their weight that they had lost made up. Whereas they, uh, it was probably about 85, 90% with the first calvers. So they're under pressure straight away. And if they're lost too much condition after the calve inside, that's when you struggle. That's when you can lose them out of the system. And that's when they can lose time in terms of breeding. The other point just Brenton quickly is, you know, with calving coming up, there's no harm. In, and we drew up this list of things that people need to think about. You know, uh, how you set up for calving, are the calving gets okay? You know, have you identified cows carrying twins if you've put done a bit of scanning? Uh, you know, do you need to vaccinate cows? You've got, you don't really vaccinate against scar within a month of calving. So are you gonna vaccinate? Do you need to vaccinate? Are the calving pens cleaned? Have they been disinfected? Was there a scar problem last year? Have you been giving them dry cow minerals and they're on up to calving? Are the cows themselves clean? Because uh, uh, E. coli mastitis can be a problem, particularly if cows are dirty in a few days before the calf and for the week or so after the calf, they can be prone to that. Uh, and again, that would be a matter of maybe having the slatted area clean, uh, the area that the calf down, you know, not to be skimping too much with straw. Uh, that they have a good dry area to lie on. Have you got beastings in? Uh, is it from a reliable source in case a cow calves with very little milk and you need to get beastings into the calf? Are your calving cameras working? Uh, you know, have you got what technology is available? You know, is the camera working? Do you have a, a calving sensor or that that you're able to use? And then the basic equipment, your gloves, your calving uh, lubrication, your calving jack, new ropes, uh, always try and have a spare packet of them there. Hopefully you won't need them. You know, are you dipping the navels? What are you using? Are you using something like iodine or chlorhexidine? Uh, you know, if you're going to have to stomach tube a, a, um, a calf um, routinely, 
with colostrum? Have you got a stomach tube that'll deal with the colostrum or do you need one for the colostrum and one for electrolytes if you have a scar problem? Have you got electrolyte on hand to get fluids and to calves? Thermometer, a warming box if, if a calf is, is, uh, is weak after it's born to get the temperature up or a calf, and ja calf jacket or whatever. And then for cows, that not so much a problem with too many suckler cows, but certainly after the go to grass, having a flutter valve available if you have to try and get a bit of magnesium or calcium onto the skin. And the other thing that there's nothing worse than calving a cow and you on your own, and she does the splits or she goes down or the leg becomes a bit numb after a bit of a pull with a calf and being able to lift her and get her out off the concrete and maybe onto, onto a bit of better ground or, or onto better footing uh, and that. Um, you know, and have you a way of, have you a strap that you can put onto the cow when she's in the calving gate? Uh, have you a, a way of lifting the cow if she does go down? Because time's against you at that stage. So try and uh, the more angles that you have covered on this, the better. And then uh, um, in terms of the scars, we, the main ways in terms of covering scars is cows in good condition. Fellas will vaccinate, get the adequate beasts into them. If there is a scar problem, what's causing it? Is it E. coli? Is it rotavirus? Is it crypto? You know, sending a sample to the lab as quickly as you can before you treat to try and get an idea on it and keeping the environment clean. And obviously the temptation to buy in a calf if a calf is lost from an outside source can be very, very high risk. And then once the calves get to that sort of month or six weeks and go, you know, keep an eye on if they become dry of the hair and that, or is there a blood scar? So very similar prevention methods uh, with regard to pneumonia. Uh, no, not, and, uh, not the minute yeah, okay. With pneumonia and that, uh, in terms of good ventilation in the shade. You know, young calves, I've seen it myself uh, in sheds, ventilation wrong in the shade and down drafts coming back on top of them in the creep area uh, or a door left open on a bad night will chill calves and leave them much more susceptible, particularly very young calves, to the likes of scur and pneumonia and that. So just, you know, you just have to be aware of that. And I suppose, look, on summary, Brenton, feeding cows according to the condition score, can we segregate the fat cows and the thin cows and the first calvers? Uh, avoid the severe restricting the cows in the last month or two. And then feeding post-calving will depend on the time of the year they're calving, what quality of silage you've available, what age of the cows are, younger cows and older cows might be under a bit more pr uh, pressure condition-wise, and then how quickly can you get them out? And, and you need to have good health protocols in place to avoid the likes of pneumonias and scars and that in calves. And look, we're coming up to a very busy time. There's people that I know and friends of mine have been hit and hurt, and some of them badly hurt with cows at this time of year because they're so unpredictable around calving. So just, you know, be careful around that and, and, and be alert to it. Yeah, Thanks, Brent. Great. That's great, Mr. Sir, Aidan. So now, if, Aidan, I'll get you to stop sharing your presentation, and I'm going to just ask our two panellists there as well, Amy and Vivian, there just to come on, and you can just stop sharing. Yeah, I'll just try and get the thing up here. So indeed, look at, uh, we have some time for questions and answers, folks. So look at, uh, you can keep putting your questions into the Q&A there, and uh, we will get those um, questions there. So um, just, I will hand it over now to Vivian, just while you're, you're uh, stopping your share there, Aidan. So um, okay. it should be just at the top of your screen. Yeah, have it, yeah. That, that's perfect. So over to you now, Vivian. Thanks, Brendan. Thanks, Amy and, and, and Aidan for joining us tonight. Uh, questions coming in, keep them coming, folks. You can type them into the Q&A box there and I'll deal with as many as I can before we, we conclude. Um, Amy, or Aidan, I'll let you catch your breath there for a minute. Amy, the first question for you is um, a question here from a listener, from a viewer. He bought in store cattle in October. They're housed about four weeks now. He hasn't done any dosing yet and he doesn't know their previous history. What's the best products to use to dose them now? You're on mute, Amy. So yes. I suppose the first thing I'd say is to do a feet leg count. You know, first yeah. off to see what the worm burden is in those cattle and to see if there are any fluke eggs showing up. And um, the second thing I'd say is if any of the cattle from that batch or maybe a similar batch were slaughtered in the last couple of weeks, you know, are there slaughter reports available, you know, through ICBF or through your factory, you could contact them to see if there were any. I suppose either fluke damage or live fluke. 
And then the other thing I'd say is to speak to his vet because look, the vet knows the farm history. Maybe if there's been any issues there before, before with worms or fluke or any resistance, so they might be able to guide you with the best worm fluke dose and maybe pour on or whatever for your ectoparasites as well. You mentioned in your talk, Amy, the people that were involved in the beef scheme for this year um, had to do some fecal egg counts. For people that aren't aware, uh, how do you get it done and where do you send the samples to? Some vets have the facility to test the dung samples themselves. Otherwise, you can contact, um, there's a number of labs, a list of labs available which test the samples for beep. You can ring them up and order your beep test kit. Um, different labs look at different prices for it. They'll send the kit out to you in the post. You collect your dung samples from your cows and you, you can post it back or you can deliver it to the lab, whichever I suppose is easiest for you. And generally you get your results back in about, I'd say, 10 days or two weeks. And it'll, it'll let you know whether, say, with fluke, if there was a high, medium or low reading for them. And likewise with rumen fluke um, and with worms, they'll, they'll give you the egg count for, for the worms or for the different types of eggs that were there. Thanks, Amy. Um, another question while you have the mic there, Amy, is a product called Distomycide, uh, in brackets, nit nitrozinyl, you mentioned in your talk, available instead of Trodex now? I'm not sure now. I haven't seen it out there. I know I've heard from a colleague in Balna that there are products available with the same active ingredient as, you know, was in Trodax, but I haven't seen any or heard any, so I can't comment on that, I okay. suppose. Okay. Might be worth going to the co-op to see if it's there, if they know of it. Okay, and I might take that one just... Yeah. Sorry, Aidan. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah, there, there is... There is um, Trodax was 34% um, concentration on the product while it was there, and it was used by a lot of farmers. And I know from talking to some of the merchants there that the stomicide is one product that's available. Um, there's another product also, I can't remember the exact name of it, but the, there is a, a slight variation in, in some of the products that have come in. I think the stomicide is 34% nitroxinol. Uh, the other one uh, that I saw um, is 27%, which will affect the dosing rate. They're, they're coming in under special license um uh, to some of the merchants and the only downside really is that some of them are limited in terms of the pack size that you can get so you may only be able to get 100 mil or 250 mils uh, and they're looking to get clearance to bring in larger packs uh larger pack size uh like that was the question that was asked to us you know has nitroxin all been banned or is it outlawed it hasn't been it's just that uh, the company that made Trodex decided that they weren't going to make it uh, anymore. But the nitroxinol as a product is not is is fine to use, but you just have to look for a different brand. And some of the merchants do stock the likes of Dasomicide and, and some of the others. Um, a related question again: Does taking a paddock out of the grazing rotation and taking two cuts out of that off silage? eliminate or reduce the worm burden in that particular paddock? Um, yeah, so I was looking back at work, I think it was done with either the Dairy Calf to Beef program or for replacement heifers and taking silage out or receiving a paddock is a really good way of reducing worm burdens. Like I suppose you're, you know, you're either taking the grass off the paddock in the form of silage or you're grazing it off and either replowing or plowing and receding or maybe you're, you know, I suppose, power hiring it and receiving that way. So it does reduce your worm burden. Um, Aidan, a question for you. Can you restrict cows using straw? You mentioned getting um, excess condition of, of fat cows over the next couple of months. Yeah, um, you could. Um, now, the, the, the point that I made earlier, Vivian, is that, that you don't go too severe. Um, I've seen fellas uh, go all straw and what you invariably find is straw is low in protein and the animal finds it very difficult to break it down and put it through the gut and you can actually bind individual cows up. So some people will, if they had a diet feeder, would mix straw through the diet feeder. Other people would feed straw for a day and then two days silage and maybe straw for a day. And the, the grass silage is given the bit of extra protein and given the, uh, the, the type of material that will help keep the straw moving through. Some cows can handle straw better than others 
I've seen some cows just get totally, totally bound up and really be pressing after a day or two on straw. And that's so you need to be careful. Um, uh, and that, you know, um, you're better to mix it with a bit of silage uh, and that, and don't go all straw and don't do it for a prolonged period. Okay, with the, with the fine summer, we had a lot of people made hay this year that never made hay. Would hay yes. be a reasonable substitute? Yeah, well, it'll be, look, if it's growing out and the, the, the DMD, if it'll be well back on silage, you're probably talking 55 to 60 DMD in a lot of cases. And certainly, yeah, what I call it, it it's, it's about taking back a bit of energy off them to thin them down. Uh, and that, Vivian, and, and you know, if you look at that compared to high quality silage, uh, you're you're definitely peeling the energy, and you don't have the protein limitation that you have with, with the likes of straw. Okay, I suppose just I suppose be mindful of the fact that you mentioned in your talk the last six to eight weeks you don't want to over punish uh, any animal, and I suppose the calf, the genetics of the calf is decided at this stage. They're either a Shirley calf or an Angus calf, and just be mindful that you don't want to pressurize the cow and, and, and over restrict. I think you emphasize that quite well in your in your in your presentation. Yeah, yeah. Um, one or two questions before we finish. Um, what is the real value of pre calving minerals, Aiden? Or what, what do they do? What's the role? Well, look. Um, obviously, what I call it, if there's if deficiency problems on the farm, it can help to correct. The big ones uh, at this time of year would be uh, selenium iodine and then obviously the level of magnesium that's going on but phil rogers who would have done a lot of work on grange over the years the biggest payback uh to dry cow minerals is calf health and calf viability you know uh, if they're on a good mineral uh, and you're keeping them right in the run up to calving you should have good lively calves that are bouncing around when they come out and anxious to get up and get moving and 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 have a uh, gives their immune system a good start. That's probably the biggest payback. There may be knock-on effects if your farm was low in copper. That you know, uh, if your supplement with a bit of copper inside, you get a bit of a carryover effect when you go out. But for other, uh, you know, for the likes of iodine and that, if there is a deficiency problem, if you stop supplementing with iodine, the blood levels will drop after about ten or twelve days, and you may have to look at going down a different route if that was the problem but I would say from the work that was done calf vitality calf figure probably the biggest area in terms of payback okay and a final question uh, and if you can answer us in the next two minutes please it's quite a broad one but how to manage when heifers uh, a lot of heifers show problems at Kevin well you have to ask yourself you're, you ask yourself why are they showing problems I suppose Vivian is the calves um uh, there's a maternal component and a, and a sire component. Uh, so is it because the uh, calf birth weight is, 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 is too big uh, or they're too heavy, which means that, uh, you know, I've seen, I've seen heifers that are two years of age were over 600 kilos calving down. And uh, they've had calves that are, you know, 47, 48 kilos uh, and would have been difficult enough equally heifers that were maybe 550 kilos, um, you know, well able to put the calf out. So is it a calf birth size issue? Are the heifers over fat? Are the heifers undergrowing uh, in terms of, of uh, sort of weight for age-wise at the time of calving down? And one of the things I suppose that we are guilty of in this country is that um, as we tend to use bulls on heifers, that are on the upper edge of uh, safety with regards to calving. You know, um, if, if you're within a month of calving, you know, you're obviously, uh, and, and, and you're running into a lot of problems, you know, you're sort of saying to yourself, well, look, um, I can't really, I don't want, I can maybe restrict the cows very slightly, but is that going to affect birth weight? And it's probably not. Um, you know, so... I would really need a wee bit more detail with regard to what, where the problem area is. Uh, is it because the heifers are too small? Is it because the bull that was used or the bulls that were used are just too strong in the birth weight of the calves? Because there is a linear relationship between birth weight uh, and that. And look, there's individual heifers out there, Vivian, that they could be that 600 kilos calving down at two years of age. 
but they don't have the pelvic width, they don't have the pelvic size, and you'll have trouble getting calves out. Thanks, Aidan. And I just want to emphasize that it was, it was the very last line in your presentation, and it was in red, but uh, following the weekend, I had a very frightening experience with a cow um, that was recently calved, and I can't emphasize to be extra, extra careful um, with cows at calving, and don't trust any of them. Um, it's, it's life or death stuff. Um, and, and people need to be conscious of that. And I'll conclude with that, Brendan. I'll hand it back to you. And, and I suppose thanks to all the viewers and, and, and the pre presenters we've had for the last four weeks. And we have another series coming up uh, post Christmas as well. That's brilliant, Vivian. And thanks very much. Um, so, look, we're just about out of time. I'd like to thank our two panelists here tonight, Aidan. Uh, Aidan Murray and Amy Connolly there, uh, Chagas and Ballina, and indeed Vivian there for handling the questions over the last number of weeks. And I suppose more importantly, I'd like to thank you at home this evening uh, for engaging with us here tonight and indeed all the previous listeners in the previous uh, episodes of the series. We hope you found the, the series of webinars beneficial and we'll get the recording uploaded to the Chagas Mio YouTube channel um, in the coming days. All that's left for me to say is that we will be back again in the new year with a new series which will focus on current topical issues such as fertiliser planning in 2022, uh, along with addressing issues such as succession and inheritance, along with environmental sustainability, which we know is going to be a big challenge. So keep an eye out for that series, and indeed the same link will apply. And indeed, look at all we want to say to people here tonight is just a happy Christmas, be safe, and indeed uh, we will see you hopefully again in the new year. So certainly it's good night from us all here in County Mayo, and indeed have a safe and peaceful Christmas, and good night from us all again. Thanks, folks. Thank you. Thank you. Good night, folks. Thank you.